All right, let's go to the Word of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, we are going to continue our series, Flawed But Called. Uh, You know, how many of you feel flawed at times? You've got some flaws in your life? Don't nudge your wife or your husband and say, you're the one, not me. We all have flaws, right? I have flaws. But yet amidst our flaws, God in His sovereignty calls us to do amazing things for his kingdom. And we got to learn to deal with each other's flaws. we got to be gracious to each other, because boy, is God gracious to us, even amidst our flaws. And David was a man who had flaws. In fact, in the next, uh, in two weeks, we're going to talk about uh, the, 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 the biggest mistake of his life related to, to his relationship with Bathsheba. But yet, As we heard last week, David was a warrior. He stood in front of a giant and took him down. And so although he's flawed, deeply flawed, he's still called to do great exploits for the kingdom of God. And so this morning, I want to, it's part two of this series. I'm going to talk about the relationship between David and Saul. And if, if you're new to church and new to the scriptures, it is found in First and Second Samuel. I encourage you in your devotional life, in your day-to-day connecting to God, read through First and Second Samuel because it is loaded with things to learn uh, about character, about leadership, and so on. And so Saul, let, let's start there. Saul was an insecure leader. And so I'm going to talk about the impact of insecurity in our lives. Now, when I say insecurity, sometimes there might be this tendency to think of others who are insecure in our lives. But the reality is, all of us probably deal with a certain level of insecurity in our lives. In fact, recently an author uh, wrote about this, and uh, his name is Maxwell uh, uh, Maltz, and he says... He estimates that 95% of people in our society have a strong sense of inadequacy. Insecurity, inferiority, and inadequacy all go together. 95% of us. I'm not sure what is the deal with the other 5%. Maybe they struggle with telling the truth. I don't know. But we all deal with a level of insecurity. Come on, we need to be honest inferiority. Sometimes we feel inadequate. And if we don't process that properly, we can actually undermine all that God wants to do in and through our lives. And Saul was one of these leaders. And, and, and sometimes when we think of insecurity, we, we, we might have this picture of that type of person, but the reality is there are corporate leaders that deal with insecurity. There are moms that deal with insecurity. There are pastors that deal with insecurity. Let me tell you. In fact, there are actresses that deal with insecurity. Watch this quote here from Jennifer Lawrence. Here's this most po- you know, really popular actress, and, and here she says, in middle school, there are all these peers judging you. You're never good enough, never wearing the right outfit, saying the right thing. I want everyone to like me. Who doesn't? Then you grow up and you become famous. And it's the same thing multiplied by a billion. So true. You know, all of us want to be liked. You know, sometimes we just haphazardly say, I don't care what people think of me. But really, we do. We do. We want people to value us. We want people to to think well of us. That's part of being human. But there's this thing called insecurity that I think lurks beneath the water lines of each of our lives. And Saul was one of those leaders. He was the king, okay? He was leading an entire nation. And he was, he was moving along. Everything was going great. And all of a sudden, he comes across this young leader named David. And he's really thankful for David. David begins to bless his ministry. But as some time goes by, all of a sudden, Saul started to feel threatened because of David's success. And so I want us to talk about this thing called insecurity because Saul was an insecure leader. So what do we learn from insecurity and the impact that insecurity has on our lives? Now listen, insecurity will impact your place of work. Insecurity will impact your marriage relationship. 
Insecurity can impact your family dynamics. Insecurity can definitely impact churches. And so we need to talk about this, the impact of insecurity. Number one, insecurity leads to disobedience in our life. When we are insecure, we make ourselves vulnerable to making choices that don't necessarily please the Lord. Let me give you an example through the life of Saul. In chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, God calls Saul and the army to defeat the enemies, the Amalekites. But he gives them one important detail. When you defeat the Amalekites, Saul, don't take any of their plunder with you. You need to destroy it all. So they go to war with the Amalekites, and they defeat the Amalekites, but guess what they do? They take the best plunder with them. Rather than doing what God had asked them to do, they took the plunder with them. Saul was disobedient to a clear instruction of the Lord. So the question has to become, why? Why did Saul disobey God? He specifically told him not to take the plunder. Well, we see why in verse 24, latter part of verse 24, when, when he's confronted by the man of God and saying, hey, what did you do? Saul says to Samuel, I've sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. He had a fear of man. Rather than doing what God had asked him to do, he was afraid. He wanted the people to like him. So much so, because of his insecurity, he did what the others told him to do rather than what God told him to do. And so there's a principle here. When we are insecure, we are vulnerable to making decisions based on the popular vote rather than what is right and honorable to God. When we are not secure in ourselves, we make ourselves vulnerable to the voices around us that tell us to do work this way, to break the law here, to do this, don't do that. And if you are not secure in yourself, you make yourself vulnerable to doing things that you know aren't pleasing to the Lord. It can create disobedience in our life. You see, the key is to find our security and our validation in Christ rather than on what people think. This is really important. It's something that as a leader and as a pastor and as a husband, as a father, as a man, I need to keep going back to. The key to my security is that I am validated by Jesus rather than what people think of me. My security, my validation, my affirmation comes from Christ. That means whether I'm really successful in what I do, whether we build this amazing church, God doesn't love me more or less, depending on how many people are in the seats. God just loves me. Whether I fail and, and have missteps in my life, that doesn't diminish the love of God. He loves me because why? I'm one of his kids. Notice when Jesus was baptized, he hadn't even begun his ministry. He hadn't done any miracles. He hadn't turned water into wine. He hadn't raised anybody from the dead. And yet it was at his baptism where the Father in heaven spoke in a voice from heaven. His Father said to him, what did he say to Jesus? You're my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. I want you to think about that. Jesus, I want you to know that before you do anything, I want you to know that as your father, I already validate you. You're mine. You're my kid. I love you. I'm already pleased with you. You don't need to do life and do ministry and do work in hopes of being validated by the father. You've already received it. You're secure in your relationship with God. So whether you get a title in front of your name or not, you've already got a title. You're a son, a daughter of the Most High God. And that's where our security comes from. So when somebody comes your way 
and discredits you and devalues you, it's, gonna, it's not going to shake you at your core because your validation has already been given by the Father. But Saul didn't have that. He was insecure. He found his validation in what people said about him. And that caused him vulnerability in doing things that were contrary to what God had called him to do. Secondly, insecurity is self-focused. Insecurity is self-focused. You'll notice in the story in First and Second Samuel, Saul promoted David to many different roles because of the benefits that David brought to him and his leadership. So David started, I mean, he was just a shepherd boy, but he raised up in the ranks of Saul's kingdom because of how successful, effective, skilled he was. And so one of the promotions he gets is he becomes uh, Saul's personal musician. Saul was tormented by evil, and he was filled with an anxiety. And so he needed a musician to play the lyre to calm his spirits down. So somebody tells him, hey, there's this young man named David. He's an amazing musician. Hire him to be your personal musician, and anytime you start feeling all this torment in you, let him play, and it'll calm you down. So David gets into the kingdom, becomes a musician, personal musician to Saul. He begins to play his instrument as Saul starts to get anxious about stuff and tormented, and all of a sudden, Saul calms down. Then he gives David a promotion and makes him an armor bearer. What is an armor bearer? It's just that. He would bear the arms of Saul. He would carry, literally, his armor around. He would, in a sense, be his bodyguard. He'd be his right-hand man. You would only give trusted people the responsibility of your own sword. All of a sudden, David was his armor bearer. He was rising up in the ranks. Saul appreciated him. He was doing great. Later, he became one of Saul's warriors. You know the story? Dr. Jim preached it so well last week. David and Goliath. He became a warrior. He took down a giant. And because of that, Saul made him next a high-ranking official in the kingdom. So he just kept going higher and higher and higher and higher. He began to to lead the army, and they had all sorts of victories. The word says David was successful wherever he went. And so Saul kept advancing him up in the kingdom into a high official. But then something happened. There's a tipping point in Saul's insecurity. David is returning after a great victory. And the women and the the people are singing a song. And he doesn't like the song. Do you know why he doesn't like the song? Because they're singing as they dance. Saul has slain his thousands. And David, his tens of thousands. Uh Uh-oh, we got a problem. You see, in the moment where others maybe are even passing us in their abilities, the insecure person will feel threatened and want to eliminate them now. Someone who was of great help, a partner, has now become a threat. Notice how he responds to this tipping point of insecurity. It kind of bubbles over. Listen to how Saul responds as he listens to this song. Saul was very angry. This refrain in this song displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought in his mind. You see, insecurity, the greatest battle is right here in our mind. But me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The word thought is really important. You see, all of us have these moments of insecurity. We begin to think things about others that are not necessarily based on truth and reality. He's out to get me. She's, she's undermined me. She's out to get my position. She, insecurity. The battle is in the mind. In those moments when insecurity wants to bubble up, when somebody is being celebrated, when somebody is being honored, 
If we're insecure, something in us tends to be disturbed by that rather than to celebrate that. That's insecurity. Saul had it. And from that day on, he kept a close eye on David. Friend, one of the most dangerous people, one of the most dangerous person is the insecure person. Do you know why? Because at the end of the day, they will do what's best for themselves rather than others. Saul lost his focus from the kingdom and what was best for the kingdom and the people he was leading to what was best for himself. And that hurt the people he was leading because of his insecurity. You see, the scriptures talk to us to be people of humility. And humility is not this, this, this characteristic that is thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. So it's not this demeaning, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a horrible person, I don't do anything good, and really, you're really talented and you're gifted. It, that's not humility. Again, it's focused on self. Humility is just simply not thinking of yourself as much. And so insecurity is self-focused. It's, it's about us and about our success and, and our threats and so on. Number three, insecurity leads to harmful schemes. You see, when we allow insecurity to fester in our heart, friends, it is an awful thing. It'll turn into active schemes in eliminating anybody who's challenging us or anybody who we feel is, 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 is trying to find position through us or whatever it is. Insecurity leads to harmful schemes. And so Saul, from that moment on, goes on the attack in trying to eliminate his greatest threat in the name of David. And so his first attack, he's having his one of those emotional breakdowns, tormented by the evil one, calls in his musician David. David begins to play. Saul's sitting there, and he's got his spear beside him. Guess what he does? Takes a spear and tries to kill him. David eludes the spear attack and gets out of there. Attack number two, as you go through at the end of chapter 18, he starts to try to set David up for failure. He sends David out to battle. He's thinking, man, I, somebody's going to knock him out. Somebody's going to kill him in battle. I'm going to put him into, the, into situations where for sure he's going to fail. Have you ever been put into those situations? You know that people want you to fall flat on your face. They try to put all the pieces together where you are going to lose at the end of the day. That's what Saul was trying to do to David. I'm going to put him in harm's way and eliminate him. Attack number three, he starts to put relational toxins in David. He thinks to himself, you know what? I'm going to give him one of my daughters. She'll mess him up. She'll get him distracted. She'll, she'll, she'll kind of get him off course. Again, relational toxins. I'm going to try to get into his relational world. Attack number four, another spear incident. It's dangerous to be a musician, eh, Chris? <laughs> you know, he's trying to calm him down, and again, he grabs his spear, tries to attack. David eludes. Attack number five, 1 Samuel 23. Saul begins enlisting willing partners. He starts to try to find other people who agree with him. In the sense of, you know what, David is out for your position. He isn't in it for the right reason. You know, you'll always find somebody to agree with your insecurities. You'll always find people, yeah, you, you're right. I think they're really, they're, they're nipping at your heels, man. You better watch that guy. You better watch that gal. They're not for you. You'll find people that'll agree with you and then join you in eliminating them. Be very careful that you don't allow the toxins of insecurity to cause you to begin to scheme, to hurt people, to wound you. Friend, you need to bring your insecurities to Jesus. You need to bring your insecurities to Jesus. Number four, insecurity comes in waves. It comes in waves. So sometimes it feels like, okay, I'm okay, I'm secure, I'm good, it's a good day. 
I'm going to release this person. I'm going to, I'm going to trust this person. And then you're going to have some days that aren't so good. It kind of comes in waves like grief. It comes out of nowhere at times. And you have to be constantly alert to, to, to this thing called insecurity that lurks between or beneath the water lines of our life. You'll notice this in Saul. In 1 Samuel 24, David actually spares Saul's life. It's an amazing moment in this chapter. David is running for his life because Saul and all of his bandits are out to kill him. So he's out in some countryside. He's hiding in a cave. And who walks in the cave? Saul. He's got to go to the washroom. It's there. It's in the text. Read it. And he's relieving himself, not knowing he's walked into the cave where David and his men are hidden. And one of David's men says, Dave, this is your chance. God has brought your enemy right in front of you. Take him out so we, got to, so we can stop running for our lives all the time. Take him out. And David looks at them, and here's character. Here's security. He says, no, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. There's something there, isn't there? But he gets convinced to cut a portion of Saul's robe. And he takes a piece of his robe. Saul walks out. And as he's walking away, David runs out after him. He says, Saul! Saul turns around. There's David with all of his men. He says, look. I've got a corner of your robe. I could have killed you. Don't listen to all the men that are telling you I'm after you to destroy you. I'm not. I could have if I wanted to, but may this be proof that I'm not out to get you. I'm out to serve you. Saul's response, of course, is, is he says, my son David, I, I've sinned. I'm so sorry. I should not be treating you this way. Please come back. Be part of my family. I won't harm you, I promise. So you think that it's over. Finally, Saul has dealt with his insecurity. He, it's not over because as you continue to read the story, he falls back into his insecurity soon after. Even though he had this encounter and, and, and this, this experience of Dave's mercy on his life, that insecurity came back with another wave. It wasn't a long time after where Saul and his men were sleeping in their tent and David and his men went into their, their campground and, and went to his very tent and he was in a deep sleep and they took the spear and they could have killed him. But David again tells his men, don't touch Saul. Soon after David wake, or Saul wakes up, they have this conversation and David once again says, Saul, stop. I'm not out to hurt you. I could have hurt you again. We could have killed you in your tent, but we chose not to because we're for you. You'd think it would be over then after that second act of grace, but it's not. Saul goes to his deathbed with insecurity in his heart. Friend, that's no way to live your life. It's no way to live your life in this, in this bondage of insecurity. You know, we need to talk a little bit about insecure behaviors. What does it look like? I, I'm always looking at my heart. I said, what kind of behaviors come out of my life that might be a signal to me that I'm dealing with insecurity? So here are some behaviors to look for in your own life. Don't just think of the person beside you. You're like, remember, 95% of us deal with insecurity, and 5% five of, five of us are liars, okay? So, so here it is. Here are some behaviors to look for if you're dealing with insecurity. One of those behaviors is aggressive behavior. Some of us are type A personalities. We are aggressive. We are, we are just performance-based. We, we want to have successful lives and careers. There's nothing wrong with that. But it can cause all sorts of aggressive behaviors if we're not careful. We tend to be impatient, work-dominated. We work, we work, we work. Why? Because we find our security in our work rather than in our relationship with the Lord. Sometimes we have a hidden anger in our hearts. We can be excessive. We are very competitive. We work and we eat way too much and relax very little. Aggressive behavior sometimes could be an indication 
where we need to be in control, where we need to always be working, we need to always be advancing, that could be a symptom actually of your insecurity. That could be a symptom that maybe you're finding your value in what you do than rather than what, who you are. You are not a human doing, friend. You are a human being. And some of us strive and work endlessly, and because of that, it might actually be a symptom of our insecurity. And there are all sorts of ramifications to our families because of that and so on. The other behavior that you might want to consider is addictive behaviors. These are self-destructive behaviors. Some of us are so... Um, you know, defeated by insecurity, inferiority, that we're discouraged, we're depleted, we feel like we're never good enough. And because of that, because we carry the weight of insecurity and inferiority and inadequacy, we look for escapes. We look for moments of pleasure. We look for moments of putting a mask of the pain. And it causes us to fall into addictive behaviors. Alcoholism. Addictions. They're about this long in our society. And what it is, it might be an actual symptom of us feeling insecure. And we have so much of it in our life that we just feel like sometimes we need to escape it. And we make ourselves vulnerable to self-destructive behaviors in our life. I spoke to a recovering alcoholic this morning. We've been ministering to him. I went to visit him not long ago at Teen Challenge in London, Ontario. And he's over four months sober. Isn't that awesome? He met Jesus here. You know how he met Jesus in this church? He came to a theater event because a church wanted to bless its community at Christmas time. That church's name was Heartland the Church Connect. He came to know Jesus. He came with all of his stuff. His partner came all with her stuff. And this morning he was sitting right there because he got a pass out. He got a pass to come out of Teen Challenge for a few days. And he was standing there like this this morning, worshiping Jesus. And he said, Joel, I want you to know it's because of my insecurities that that bottle has been swallowing me up, but no more. I find my security in Jesus now. You see, insecurity will destroy our lives. This is no laughing. This is no just pop theology and self-help. It goes so much deeper than that. Third behavior is this, critical behavior. If you tend to be critical of others, and boy, can you find things to critique in people's lives. Oof, you're good. It might actually be a sign of your own insecurity. Sometimes we help ourselves feel better by knocking everybody else around down. That actually might be a symptom of your own insecurity in your life. Where rather than celebrating others and their strengths, you focus on their negatives and you make sure they hear it or everybody else but them hears it. Because it does something in you that makes you feel better about yourself. Friend, those are symptoms and behaviors of insecurity in your own life. So how do we defeat this? How do we defeat insecurity that lurks beneath in our lives? Because every one of us deals with it in some way or form. Here are a few thoughts right out of David's life. The first is this. Always trust God as your vindicator. Trust God as your vindicator. Some of us tend to always want to make wrongs right. We want to get in there and make people pay the price and, and deal with the ramifications. And sometimes God says, that's my job. I am the vindicator. I know your heart. I know their heart. Trust me. I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. Sometimes when we want to take care of it, we actually make more of a mess. Notice what David says to Saul. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand 
will not touch you. Oh, isn't that awesome? That's tough stuff. That's real. This guy was after to kill him. This is not just a co-worker who said just some smarky remark. This was his enemy. And yet he hadn't done anything wrong to him. If anything, he served him and his leadership and his kingdom, and all he got back was hatred. And yet at the end of the day, David stands before him and says, I'm not going to repay evil with evil. I'm going to repay evil with good. God knows my heart. He knows your heart. At the end of the day, he'll take care of it. Rest in that, friend. Allow him to be your vindicator. Honor and direct. Here's a second piece of advice. Honor and direct others to honor. What amazes me most, as I kept reading this story, Saul eventually dies in his insecurity. And I, 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 was, I was reading and saying, well, how did David respond to Saul's death? Did he throw a party? Did he celebrate? Finally, God, you're my vindicator. You took him down. No, he doesn't. He actually writes a lament. And he mourns Saul's death. He actually then encourages the people that Saul was under to honor Saul as their leader. Remarkable, isn't it? That would have been his moment to kind of give him one last blow. But Saul doesn't. In fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12, he says, They mourned and they wept and they fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and for the nation of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. David then writes in verse 23, Saul and Jonathan, a life they were loved and admired. I want to be like that. I want to be the kind of person that is so pure in heart that even though those, there are those that crit criticize, that hurt, that speak words, that wound, that I would always repay evil with good, that I would always strive to honor those, even those that haven't been fans. A secure person can do that. Because their validation comes from God. Thirdly, desire God's will for your life. Listen, it's okay to want to be successful in your life and in your career and in your ministry and all that goes on with life. That's, that's a good thing. And to work hard and move forward. But remember this. Let God promote you when he wants to promote you. Don't push your way through. Do what God wants you. And if he wants to open that door, he'll open the door. You be faithful with the little that he's given to you, and as you're faithful with that, he'll give you more, and he'll give you more. But don't pursue it without God leading you there. Ask for the will of God to be accomplished in your life. And remember this, as God does promote you, as God does allow you to influence more people, don't lose sight that the whole point is so that you can bless others more rather than to be more self-focused. The point is to have influence over more people. It's not to build your own kingdom. It's not so that you get a bigger name in front of your, 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 your name, to a bigger title. The point is now God has given you an opportunity to invest in even more people. And so the will of God is always others-focused, never selfish-focused. And here's another thought about the will of God. I just felt the Lord depositing this in my heart this week. Is don't be afraid of the second chair. For people who are on the first chair, leading, don't get too comfy with the first chair. Sometimes God is calling you to invest in a younger leader so that they can take over your position one day. Don't fight that. Celebrate that. Mentor them. Coach them. Love them. 
And for those of us sometimes that are in the second chair, don't see that as a, as, 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 as a defeat. Sometimes the greatest influence comes from the second chair. And be okay with the will of God if that means you're sitting in the second chair. But jostling for position, the insecure person will do that till the day they die. But the secure person is content with what the will of God is for their lives. Finally, the last piece I'll leave with you is stay anchored in Christ no matter what waves of life come your way. Pastor Chris, team, come on up. Stay anchored in Christ no matter what waves of life come your way. Hebrews 6.19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. That's why we sang this morning, It is well with my soul. No matter what comes my way, Lord, I sing to you because my soul is right with you, because I'm one of your kids, whether I've got the title or not, whether... Whatever the situation is, Lord, I find my identity in you. Use me to serve others and influence others. May I never get preoccupied with self, but may I give my life away so I can be a blessing to others. Friends, who wants to be secure here? Who wants to eradicate insecurity from their life? Anybody? Oh, Lord, I want it to leave me. So I could be free. 